This is the I Love Success Podcast. I'm Peter Jurukowski, and I have made a vow to myself to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams. Let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to the I Love Success Podcast. Before I introduce this week's incredible guest, I just want to take a moment to chat a little bit with you guys. Uh, thank you for being here week after week. If you're new to the show, you'll learn very soon that my big fat mission is to help at least 10 million people in 10 years to go after their dreams. But right now, you are the most important person to me. If you're listening to this, I want you to you know, buckle up, take notes, and make sure you find at least one or two little nuggets that can improve your life. And I am 100% certain that they are there. Uh, If you're ready, we, I don't want you to waste your time. If this is not for you, do something else. But if you really want improvement, if you really want to create a life that you're proud of, make this world a better place, create happiness, and whatever it is that you're looking for, you're in the right place. I am a big believer in writing down goals. I even wrote a book about it called The Goal Book, uh, How to Achieve Your Dreams and Create a Better Life. So I've always, not always, I would say, but since I was 15 years old, so for about 20 years now, I've written down my goals uh, because that's just what I learned from my father, who is uh, my karate sensei, and also from you know all the books that I read. Always b- big believer in pen to paper, not so much in typing it on my phone. Uh, I just want to do a plug now for Remarkable 2 that I have been using for the last month or so. It's, it's a very cool thing. You write on a device, but it feels like you're actually writing on a paper. You can read articles or books without any of the, you know, that the light you have from all these screens, you can make notes. And it it feels like writing on a paper. So if you want to be a little bit more modern and digitalized, check out Remarkable 2. And without further ado, I am here today with Emil Steenveld. And he is an emotional intelligence coach. He used to be a model in New York City, you know, for cool brands such as Versace, Hugo Boss, Calvin Klein. Nike and many others. Uh, Now he is living on the island of the gods in Bali, uh, where where he is helping people from all around the world to to create that, you know, abundance and happiness and fulfillment in life and not only wealth. And, And this is something that I'm such a big believer in. You can't just chase money because you'll have to deal with other issues later. So people like Emil makes me so happy and I'm grateful that we are here today. So welcome Emil Emil Steenveld to the I Love Success podcast. Thank you for having me, Peter. I'm looking forward to like really diving in with some gems and uh, seeing what comes of this conversation. Yeah. Awesome. So so I want to, you know, dig right into it. I know... uh, you were looking for your father's approval for many years, your father's love. Uh, when did that start? And like, why didn't you get it, do you think? Good question. You know, what an awesome question to start with. Um, when did it start? I started looking for my father's approval from a very young age. And when I think it really began was when my father stopped telling me I love you. And it's not that he, he didn't, he didn't love me, but he stopped expressing it. And Peter, the, this is the thing these days is that, you know, expression is one of my highest values for one. And two, if we don't have full self-expression, what we're doing is we're shutting off parts of ourselves. And this is what we do as, as human beings, you know, from zero to seven, we grow up and we get um, imprinted, you know, what our parents are teaching us and we believe that as truth. And then what happens during that time, things will happen. You decide in that moment, I don't want to feel like that or I do want to feel like that or I want to protect myself so that doesn't ever happen again, right? Now, what happened when I was young, um, I remember because I've really done a lot of work around this when I was about four years old, my 
I remember going to kiss my father and I, and I would go up to my mom and give her a kiss and I would kiss her on the neck. And, you know, that was my way of like being like, instant, like cuddly and like just cute with my mom. And I remember being that, doing that to my father and he had a different response. And this is the funny thing about like when you have kids and you're raising kids because you don't know what's going to hit them and what's not and what they're going to hold on to. And I remember me going to do the same thing to my father and be like, you know, I was just playing around with him, but I was a kid, you know, we're my children. And I went to kiss him on the neck and he goes, oh, and he laughed at me and he goes, what are you, a Muffy? Now, my parents are South African. Now, a Muffy in Afrikaans means like, what are you gay? But he was joking. He kind of laughed. And I made it mean, because that's what we do. We are meaning making machines. I made it mean in that moment, don't kiss men. Don't show affection to men. Don't show emotion. And slowly after that, I stopped kissing my father hello like that. And then what he did, because he's a human being as well, is he slowly, as I pulled away, he also pulled away because he's like, well, he's not acting a certain way and I'm not going to act a certain way. And that's when I first, you know, really pulled back and was like, he doesn't give me the affection that I wanted or the approval, you know? And yeah. when we broke it down, you know, years later, I'm doing a workshop. Um, I'm about 21, 22. And I remember in the workshop, I really wanted my girlfriend to come to this workshop. And one of the facilitators was like, well, why do you want it to come? And I was like, I would just do anything for her. And he's like, well, why is it so important that you want her to come? And I said, well, I just think that this would benefit her so much. You know, I've just learned so much about myself. And that was the first time I'm getting really exposed to self-development. And he goes, do you love her? And I froze in my right in my tracks and I was like oh. um and he said to me do you love her and I said I don't I don't know he goes have you expressed love to her have you expressed that you love her and I said no and that was when that moment hit me so hard that I realized I had a problem with love so the funny thing is for whoever's listening right now like it's it can be this so some of the most tiniest moments in your life when you make an agreement and I made an agreement is that one my father never expressed love to me so I would reject it I wouldn't express it and we were pattern we we we, we make patterns it's like my parent my dad was raised like this then he's gonna raise me like this and then I'm gonna raise my child like this and then and so forth and when I realized that I was still seeking approval was when I was constantly justifying and trying to be this perfectionist and trying to strive for the most amazing like i would set my goals and set them high and i would only acknowledge myself peter if i got them and when i realized this it was it, it, it's all connected right so everything is connected to you know being a perfectionist is because i didn't love myself so i would get love or approval through achieving things and for those perfectionists that are listening right now, think about that for a second. Why, you know, I, I'm not against going for your goals. I, I'm all for it. I'm still like, let's get it, create it, build it, you know, but make sure it's in alignment with your soul, with your heart and not with your head. Yeah. As so many of us are trying to get this goal or trying to get the approval or trying to get the achievement because I think it's going to fill this gap. I mean, that, that was my life. And, um, when, when you say this, like it hits me uh, that I forget that sometimes and I validate my, my self-worth in my achievements. And it, it's so crazy because we're already worthy, right? Uh, yeah. And I know I'm not the only one. Can we talk about how did you go from, from being that goal oriented person who who that was what gave you you know a sense of self worth and love so to speak uh, to to the person you are today and what can people do that are you know out there right now that their 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 only validation is their external success yeah i was um 
I had to do a lot of work. I mean, and I'm saying a lot of work in the space of like not go out external and achieve more. I had to go do go in. I had to go in on myself and really like sit with myself and take radical responsibility for how things were showing up for me in my life. And I just came out of a pretty bad um, relationship that was quite toxic and I needed, I needed healing. And I remember my father saying to me, Hey, I know you've just gone through some, you know, some tough stuff. And we'd already done a few like self development workshops and shifted a lot of stuff. But just because you've done one self development workshop or you've done, you've read a book or this and that doesn't mean that it's over. Like you got to consistently do the work, right? It doesn't ever stop. I've been doing this. I've been coaching for 10 years. I still take courses. I still have a coach to, to call me out. And I remember we decided to do the Camino de Santiago. This is the walk. It's called the way. So my father and I, we walked for a solid month. About for people 30... who don't know where that is, can you just share um, yeah. where that is and how long it is? Yeah, so that is um in Spain, and you walk from the south of France, and you start in the south of France, and you walk through the um the mountains in France, and and you walk to the west coast of Spain, and we walked literally every day for about 35 kilometers in miles be about 20 to 25 miles a day um, with a backpack and um, when you walk that long you had a lot of time to think and a lot of time to be present and a lot of time for stuff to come up and um, and I remember walking one day Peter and and as I'm walking through these fields I'm listening to Eckhart Tolle and he's talking about approval and he's saying you know you're never going to get the acceptance or the approval from your parents so stop looking for it and and in my head I was like anger like just a ball of anger came up out of nowhere and I was so furious because I was like my whole life I've been striving to be good enough for him to say something to me and that's a dangerous game that we play you know if we're constantly waiting for them to give us the approval before we can then feel okay about ourselves you're never ever going to feel it you're always going to be disconnected you're always going to be thinking in your mind versus in your heart of like this is what actually matters to me and that was the moment I was like you know what I'm not going to ask for permission anymore and every time I feel like I'm going to because it becomes a habit right yeah. And a few examples, let me give you an example for people listening. I would, I wasn't living with my father at the time, but every time I would catch up with him, I would feel the need to tell him what I was creating and what I was building and all the good things that were happening unconsciously. Right? Oh, oh, I just signed a big client. Oh, I just got this contract. Oh, I'm flying here. Why did I need to do that all the time? And I had to consistently, like mindfully practice catching myself doing that, going, oh, I'm doing that again. I'm looking for his permission. And it, 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 when you look for people's permission, it leads to disappointment. When you're looking for the approval, it leads to suffering. And we constantly do it. It's like expectations. I would set all these expectations. Like my father was a great father. Like he, he showed up. He was he was um a provider he when things were going bad he would make sure that we always had food on the table like he was he took care of stuff he had integrity he wasn't there emotionally but he did his best so when you're constantly judging someone and saying he needs to show up like this he needs to be like this he needs to be more like this he's showing up exactly as your judgment and the moment it shifted, it was when I stopped expecting him to be a certain way that I wanted and accepted him for who he was in that moment. Because I accepted me for who I was in that moment. And we're all mirrors. I mean, I think, I think self-acceptance is the hardest part. I'm a martial artist, so I spend a lot of time, you know, meditating and, and, and kind of working on myself and um, and for every day I get closer you know to the person I am on the inside 
that's the person I'm showing up in the world. I, I think I'm very close right now. I used to be almost two-faced and I think a lot of people do recognize that. Uh, but like, what, what tips can you give to people that are, you know, they're, they're afraid of showing up who they are, you know, they're, they're f- afraid of judgment or, or not being loved for, for the real, the real them, you know? Yeah. I think some tips um, that I still use is I, I really ask myself, where am I hiding? What am I avoiding? And what am I pretending not to know? So what we do as human beings, our subconscious is running the story. It's running 90%. And you've got 10% of your consciousness that you're like, that you're aware of, that you're doing. And we need to become investigators. We need to investigate with compassion how we show up and why we get certain results and why we attract certain people in our lives. And I always ask myself, like, what is it that I'm hiding from? And, and when I ask that question, a whole bunch of answers will come up. When you sit in meditation, you, you really sit and you're like, okay, well, what is stopping me from going to the next level? What is stopping me from approaching? What is stopping me? You get a bunch of answers. Oh, I don't want to be judged. Oh, I don't know if I can handle rejection. And I used to, to be honest, Peter, I used to be shit scared of rejection. Like, like to the point where unless I was good at it and I knew I was going to succeed, I wouldn't attempt it. Right. And that's where so many people live these days is that they, they only attempt things that they're like, Oh, I don't know if my ego can handle that. Right. So I'll keep hiding and I'll keep pretending like everything's good, but deep down you're empty and you're watching everyone else play the game and you're sitting here on the sidelines watching. Now, how I got over that was, was acceptance, was asking myself, what is it that I, that I judge about myself? Because ultimately, those judgments is what is then being projected outside. So I would go in and go, okay, well, I'm not confident in certain things. How can I be more confident in this area? Or how can I be more, um, how can I trust myself? And how do we get more confident in anything? We practice. So a pure example, I used to hate speaking on camera. Like I was a model, but I used to, like if I had to speak like um, not, with, not with interviews or coaching like or anything like that, but if I had to speak to camera and there's no one else there and I'm just speaking to camera, I'm like, hey guys, blah, 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 blah. I would get so in my head and it was because I had so much judgment about how my mouth was going, my voice, Um, Am I making sense? I was more worried about what I was looking like instead of connecting. And I made it about me. And the more I shifted that, it was one practice, but two, stop myself. I had to stop myself from going, this isn't about you. This is about them. And the more I did that, the more I took myself out of the equation. Yeah, that's great. And and, and one more point. So one more point, um, the vulnerability of owning it. Like I remember when I shot my first video and I saw it, it was cringeworthy and I was stopping and starting and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and what got me through that video was admitting that I was actually like, really like shitting myself inside. And I said that I'm actually really afraid right now. And the moment I admitted it, the moment the fear stopped because I was like, not trying to pretend to be something else. I was just like, this is who I am. This is what I'm creating. And I talked about fear in the end. And it was kind of funny because I was like, I feared doing this video and I admitted it. And the beautiful thing is the moment you admit something or you are vulnerable and you accept it, the moment you can use that as power. But so many people go, well, vulnerability is weakness or I don't want to be vulnerable because it's going to hurt and it will only hurt if you haven't embraced that vulnerability first. Yeah, I mean, you're hitting me again, man, because I've done 230 something episodes of my podcast, but I haven't started recording my own videos where I just talk into the camera. I like three months ago or four months ago, I bought the equipment for it, but I haven't done it because exactly what you were saying, I'm afraid that it's not going to make sense. I'm afraid of that I'm going to look bad and that I'm going to stumble on my words and don't know what to say and that people will make fun of me and like 
all those limiting beliefs. And the reason I want to share that with the audience and you is that nobody has all their shit together. Like you can look yeah. at someone like me or like us, like, oh, they're doing this and that, but there's, we, we still have things that we need to overcome. And I know this is something that I need to overcome uh, by one, like you said, take yourself out of the equation. If you have, if I'm, if I'm so serious with my mission, this yeah. should not be a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you have a big why, take yourself out of the equation and, and also you just got to practice, right? It really is. I mean, I think the biggest thing for me in getting myself out of my head with this kind of stuff, and it's so funny, we're very similar, Peter, because I also <laughs> bought like the best camera, a setup, <laughs> everything like, and I still waited and it just sat in that bag. And, and this is the thing is I had to add one key ingredient to this. And one of my top values is fun and play. So I had to ask myself, how can I have fun doing this? How can I play? And the moment I did that, the moment it took the seriousness and the rigidity, rigidity out of this um, task and go, and you should see, like, I add bloopers to my videos too as well, because I'm like, this is stupid. And I'm like, literally <laughs> so many different bloopers. And I'm just like, and it, and it relaxes you into that space, into childlike. And, and this is what we need to go back to is like, when we were children, we, we weren't concerned about what we looked like. We just did it. We're in our being. Yeah. And I think this is what is so important today is that we get, we get so caught up in the doing that we miss the being. And the being is actually way more important. It's the flow. It's the part where you just go out and you actually allow it to come out of you instead of trying to control it. Yeah. I, you're so right. And I mean, if for people listening right now, you if you have something like that, just just go out and do it and bring back the fun and play. I know I was a high performer for many years as a martial artist, athlete, and my best performances was when I had fun and played. You know, yeah. it's it's so true. When I tried to hold on to my ego and that I had to win and all of that, my performance was, was worse. And even if I won, I wasn't even happy. And if I lost, it was a disaster. And it's just a freaking competition, you know? <laughs> There will come another one in a couple of weeks. So, uh, yeah, you, you're totally right. Uh, one thing that I'm curious about, you're talking a lot about the true meaning of success and happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole world, in a, in a way, is a little bit skewed when it comes to what is success and what is true happiness. And what I'm doing with this show, I call it the I Love Success podcast, but I, I don't know if I need to rename it because the success has you know, in, in the mainstream world that it's, it's the money, right? And that's not a, really what success is. Uh, for me, there's so much more to it. Uh, so can you share like, what are your thoughts and meaning of success and happiness? Yeah, so for my meaning of success is to be fully in alignment with your values. And the reason why I start with that is because your values is your foundation of how you make every decision. It's how you build relationships. It's how you feel alive naturally. It's, it's where energy comes from. It's not, it's not in your head, it's in your body. And it's, it's your values is your gut. Like you listen to your gut and your gut goes, mm, I don't know if you should do that. And your gut says, yes, let's go for it, right? It's a second brain. And I think once we align with our values and we live by our values, and I mean, not just like knowing your values, but I mean, like actioning them on a daily basis. Like my values are literally, I have them on my wall and I have wealth creation. And why do I have wealth creation is because I want to live a life where I can live abundantly, but also create opportunities for other people. Uh, focus, because if I'm more focused, then I'm able to create and break down less distractions and create more and be more productive and um, live in a more present way. Uh, health, if my health is on point, then I'm gonna have more energy, I'm gonna be able to create, I'm gonna be in better mood, I'm gonna create more happiness. Uh, fun and play, um, the more fun I'm having, the more I'm going to keep my enthusiasm up. Uh, courage, because when I'm afraid, I go towards the fear. And every time I feel that fear, I'm, I'm reminding myself that courage is something that you need to step into and play, 
right? And trust, because if I really trust and go in and connect to my intuition, I always have the answer. If I sit and be with myself and I listen to that, right? It, it speaks very subtle, subtly, but those are those whispers that you need to listen and go and take the courage and go, you know what? That's what you need to do and move forward. So when I live by my values, I know and I check in and I go, what values did I, was I avoiding? What values did I not play? And most of the time, if I'm having, having a, a shit week or I'm not in flow, it's usually because I'm not practicing my values, right? So for me, it's going, know your values. Your value sets the boundaries, your standards of how you show up daily. It, it shows you your worth. And then from there, it's like, create your dream in that space of like your alignment with that. And when you do that on a consistent basis, that's success because you're not basing it on if I have more money or if I create this or if I do that or if this person accepts me, like then I'm going to be happy and successful, right? We, we do this all the time. It's like when I get seven figures, when I do that, we're basing it on a, something that's outside of us. So the more you base it on something that's in alignment with you and success can mean anything. I could go, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to go to the, this week, I'm going to go to the gym three times this week. And that deems me successful. And it's my definition. And it's not based on if you say it's successful or not. And I think that's what we get caught up with these days is that we get sold a dream, we get sold this illusion and the success is what actually brings more suffering because we're not doing it by our idea. It's someone else's idea. Yeah, I mean, I think the hardest thing is that we compare ourselves and we see we get bombarded with so many, so many different uh, types of success, right? Mm -hmm. how, how do we handle that? You know, even like, let's just say if you're in, a, in, an, in your own environment at work if somebody's performing better all of a sudden you get stressed out right and then you, if we're talking about people that have their own business uh, you see someone that is doing better at, on instagram or it seems like that or if you're an athlete there's someone else that is winning what you want to win like how do you live in that environment and and you know thrive and at the same time stay happy yeah it's interesting you say that because i'm literally talking about it yesterday um to my one of my operations managers in my business and and I'm looking at some of these like I've been coaching for I've been in the game coaching professionally for 10 years and I'm seeing coaches come out of the woodworks and there's and there's and it's changed since I first started nobody really knew what coaching was um yeah. back then and now I'm seeing people come up and you know there's clubhouses all these different um, platforms is Instagram, there's Twitter, there's, like, there's all these different platforms and the way people are, are bragging and, and saying things like a pure example, uh, I'm a seven figure, uh, seven figure coach and da, 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 and all these accolades and it's, it's money is, is a way of attracting people because people think, you know, if this person's a seven figure coach, they must know what they're doing. And I've never led by that. I've never led by uh, this is how much money I earn. So you should coach with me. I've always led by learning the craft and mastering the craft. Um, and I think we got to get really, you got to question it and your ego is always going to compare. It's going to want to compare. It's going to see if I'm better, if I'm more superior or inferior based on what it's comparing. So if it's, if it's, if I'm superior, then I feel good and I feel good about myself. But if I'm comparing to myself to someone who has done more then I'm going to feel shit about myself. And I think we've got to really check ourselves and go, okay, what is it in me right now? What am I looking for right now? And is this in alignment with my values? Because that person may look successful on the outside. And this is what I'm really good at because I coach high achievers, high performers. I coach people that have like, they're creating millions in their business, but behind the scenes, I'm seeing a person that can't sleep at night. I'm seeing a person that, has a bad relationship with their, their partner. I'm seeing a person that is a human being that is trying to hold up this facade, but deep down is like mentally unstable because they're not acknowledging parts of themselves. They're disconnected. So it's, it's, it may look great on, you know, in, in, in front of your face and it may look 
amazing, but everybody has their own demons and everybody's human in that way. And, and we've got to recognize that and really check in and, and recognize when you are going into that space of comparing because you need to check in. That's a pure indication to go, okay, I'm not focusing on me now. I'm not focusing on my mission. And it's funny, I was, reading, I was watching a video the other day of these horses and it was a horse race and this guy was literally saying, I don't know, it's from a documentary, but he was saying, um, you see when horse racing, he goes, they put the blinkers on the eyes because the horses can't look at the other horses because it will like distract them or get them off track. And then all of a sudden, all the horses started like falling and like tumbling, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's like when you're constantly, if you're constantly focusing on somebody else's journey, you're missing the point in your own. Yeah. Oh, you're right. And I, I go back to, I, I finished the Matthew McConaughey's book, Green Lights, a couple of weeks ago now. And one of the quotes, I don't know if you read it, but it's... it's I, know. I heard it's amazing. My girlfriend literally is obsessed with it. Yeah, um, you, okay. sh- you, will, you will love it, I think. And, and, but one, the, the best sentence of the whole book for me was, less impressed, more involved. And... Wow. I really like that because it's so easy. I know as an athlete, you know, I won competition. It's so so easy to start believing in your own bullshit and slack off in the training and don't do what's fun or what took you there. And just like having all these distractions. But I, I, I try to remind myself now, hey, this is my life. My routines is what matters. My, my interactions in this moment is what matters. Everything else, the results, they will just come you know, and they will go as well because nothing ever stays, but my involvement in things or in everything that could, that could stay constant if that's what I want. Right. Yeah. That's a great saying. And so many of us are, we're we're, we're attached. We're so attached to what it has to look like this. And sometimes that can even stuff us up because it's almost like I'm so fixed on i want it to look like this and it has to come in this package and that color or you know that we actually miss a bigger opportunity yeah you know yeah i mean uh, emil I- i'm curious how-, how do you get from from the hugo boss catwalk in new york city to the islands of the gods being you know this uh, super cool guy and coach you know and and talking about emotional intelligence like what what has that journey been for you for people that are you know a little bit more curious curious about you as a person i mean personally i i joined i got into emotional intelligence because i was terrible with my emotions right and it was because of my father he didn't show emotions he didn't know how to express love and when i remember that i had a problem with love it really got me clued on like i don't want to be like that with my children yeah. I don't want to have the same thing happen. And I realized that everything is patterns. And I started looking into self-development more. And the more I looked into it, the more I really understood that everything is to do with our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Like we, are, we react to things. We, we're instinctual. Like we you know, have certain DNA. It's like we go into fight or flight mode. Sometimes we don't even know what we're doing. It could, it could be part, it could be generational. You know, like people are like, I don't know why I act like this and I do the same thing and you get different results. And it's like, is there so many factors? So when I really wanted to, I dive deep into it is because one, my mother's a psychologist. So I started reading a lot of these books quite early and um, breaking down certain things. And one of the first books was Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And it was because I was constantly like, I would take stuff personal, you know, and when people were, friends would cut, um, just like exclude me I would literally like cut them off and be like you can't do that and you know and cut people off and burn them and 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 then just be stoic about it and be like I'm fine like everything's good but I was numbing myself you know and that numbing was just a protection and I think the more I learn about that the more I was like wow that's just a pattern And after a while, you can't keep doing that. You're going to live a very lonely life. So why I got into emotional intelligence is because one, I felt like it's not spoken about enough and it is the key to your freedom. It is the key to expression. You know, so many of us have these emotions or feelings that come up on a consistent basis and we push them down and we do that through food, sex, 
alcohol, drugs, porn, anything to get that dopamine hit, but not really feel it. And I think once we really befriend our emotions and are not afraid of them, we can actually just go, oh, I'm noticing I'm having this emotion and it moves. And I'm telling you, if I didn't do this work, like I'm thinking about this pandemic right now and so many people are like freaking out, like I can't do this, I can't do that. And in my head, like it, the thought does come up sometimes. I wish this was over. I wish I could just go back to normal and this, this, this. And, and then I have to check in and be present with myself, you know? And as I be present with myself, that thought moves and I don't, I don't sit on that thought. Now, when I'm practicing and, and getting into this even in a deeper level, it really doesn't ever stop, Peter. It's a constant practice. And how I went from modeling to this is basically the modeling. Like I took books with me every hour would journal. Like the modeling taught me so much about myself. Like I was shit scared of rejection. And then I went into an industry that was 90, 95% rejection yeah. and all image and what you look like mattered. And my biggest fear was rejection. And then I went, I went to the fear and, and I didn't just go to it like at the start. I waited a good two, three years before I jumped into the modeling game. Cause I asked, I got asked when I was 18 first and I said, no. And I said, no, because I was like, oh, I, I don't know if I can do that. I was actually shit scared of rejection. Yeah. And a year later, someone else was like, hey, I reckon you, you'd be really good. Da, da, da. Do you want to come and do, join this agency? So I finally said yes. And I went to this agency to go get scouted. And um, they said no. And I was like, I'm never doing this again. Yeah. Right. And then three years later, again, somebody was like, hey, uh, you know, and I was doing like fashion shows and stuff, but I wasn't with an agency. It was just like in a club or something. And I got asked again and I was like, no. And then my friend, I did a show with this guy who said, you know what, come and join my, my agency. It's really small. And I thought, wow, I'm going to get into an agency. I'm just going to go for it. So I went and she said, yes. And it was crazy because I like totally different. Like the funny thing, talk about acceptance, right? I had curly hair. I have curly hair. My parents are South African. And I remember when I first started modeling, when I first had my very first photo shoot, it was for a company called American Crew, which is like a hair product company. Yeah. And they chemically straightened my hair. And I don't th even think I've shared this on a podcast, but I remember when I had my hair chemically straightened, I was like, yes, I'm going to make it. I look really good. Like when I look back at these pictures, I'm like, I'm cringing at the, the look of it. Like, it's like, I had like a a mullet, you know, the sides were shaved on the side. It was like, maybe you can send one of those pics. I can share it to my, with my audience. They will oh my want God. to see that. <laughs> I, I've got to find it. It's in deep, deep, deep in the archives. But I literally <laughs> remember going, yeah, I look good. And I went to the agency with my chemically straightened hair. And it was one of the biggest agencies in Melbourne, um, in Australia, where I grew up. And they were like, yeah, no, you're not right for us. And I was so, I was shitting myself so much. I couldn't even remember who I spoke to. Anyways, a year later, I get accepted to this other agency. My hair is back to normal. It's kind of curly, but I was still sometimes chemically straightening it, straightening it, or I had a straightener. I had a straightener, right? And I remember seeing my portfolio and it was like some with curly hair, some with straight hair, and I wasn't working yet. And then I decided to cut my hair shorter. And when I was going on a trip with my boys, like to Europe, and I came back and my hair was short and I was like, oh, it actually really works. And that's when I started working. And it's so crazy because the modeling taught me about, it doesn't matter what you look like. Like it really doesn't. It, I, when I first started modeling, it was all about like, I was looking at who was doing well at the top of the industry and how do I follow in their footsteps? What do I need to do? So I literally would like watch videos i would look at magazines and i would copy movements and eventually that's how that practice got me got me more confident in doing that on a consistent basis i would also 
read self-development books back then. Like I was 21 and I'm reading self-development books on how to connect, how to, how to have better people, people skills. Because I knew when I went into a casting, I had literally 10 seconds to make an impression and build a connection. So I started studying a long time ago, not knowing that this is where I was going to go, but understanding that if I can make them remember me out of 200 people and build a connection, and when I work, I made sure that if every job I got, I was the easiest, most professional model they've worked with. And because I do that on a consistent basis, people would rehire me. They're like, you're really easy to work with it would spread and eventually led to like me trying different markets. I was like, well, I'm doing really well in Melbourne now. I'm going to go to Hong Kong. Then Hong Kong did really well. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to LA. So it wasn't just like, oh, I'm just going to go to New York. It was step by step. And during that process, every single country was a different lesson for me. Just when I thought that I'm, I'm the shit and I've got my things together, guess what? I go to a place like LA and the recession hits in 2007. And all of a sudden, I'm working three jobs and my car gets repossessed and I'm basically broke. I went from making a lot of money to going to a market that didn't really embrace my look because apparently I was too ambiguous and I wasn't black enough or I wasn't Hispanic. They were like, what are you? And I'm like, I'm, I'm Australian, but I'm South African. So it was one of those things where it just... You know, I went to LA, I got broken. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to New York and try New York. So I went to New York and started working better. And it's the next minute I'm doing New York Fashion Week. And it's, it's such a game of like the rejections make you and redirect you. And, and because I didn't take those rejections personally and I kept staying true to myself and, and true to myself to the point where even in New York, like I just, I've been some with major models Three years had been up. I'd been in uh, America three years and I just got a new contract and I was about to sign with them and I ended up checking out Wilhelmina Models, Wilhelmina in New York. And I got signed to them. They were doing my papers and everything. And I said, you know what? I'm just going go to I'm just gonna go to India for like a couple of months. And then I went to India and I never returned. I went to India for two years and I was sitting in a Vipassana. For those of you guys that don't know what Vipassana is, it's a silent meditation. And I was sitting literally in Leila Ladakh, which looks like the Himalayas, like with a monk and like six other people and meditating eight hours a day, maybe eight to 10. And it was the most painful <laughs> experience I've ever had. And I just kept on asking myself these questions, like, where do I want to go next? Do I want to keep doing this? And the answer came back clearly was, I don't want to go back to New York. And I ended up staying in, the, in India for two years and studying my coaching business. And do, I, I, was yoga, I studied yoga. I did my yoga teacher training and I really got into my connection with myself. And that's what India brought out of me was that I was striving for success. And it's funny, your podcast is, is success. It's, I'm going to go to America. I'm going to make it. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to be famous. And then I'm going to impact people. That, the dream was always to impact people. But I thought that I had to be famous before I had to do that. Yeah. And what I realized is that when I was in India, I was focusing on the wrong things. And India brought me back to simplicity and grateful a grateful attitude of what I have already because I saw people on the street that had nothing but were still smiling. And I was like, how can they be happy when they have nothing? And I felt like all of a sudden I was like, wow, what am I focusing on? And when you change your focus, if you start focusing on trying to have more and more and more and focus on what you do have, it changes your whole attitude. And then that changes your energy of what comes to you. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I struggle with is that, you know, how do you keep the balance of, you know, wanting things, wanting to create this, you know, abundance lifestyle or a great business, but also be, you know, emotionally aligned with yourself, keeping your core values when you're trying to fight, you know, the big 
big dogs, right? How do you how do you manage all that together? And and that's something that I'm working with every single day. Uh, but I'm curious, like, how do you do it? Um, my first rule is never betray your values, no matter what. So if you you got to be so solid with your values because that's your foundation. That's how everything comes into your life, right? So if I'm going outside of my values and going, I know I can create more money. I do, absolutely. But I know that that's not going to be the answer. I know that that's not going to make me happier. I know that if I create more money doing something that I don't like, I'm going to be in the same boat I was when I was modeling and making a lot of money and money was coming into my account and it was coming in every single week, you know, thousands of dollars, but I was lonely. I was burnt out. I was disconnected. And it's great when you got a lot of money, but if you got no, no one to share it with and you're not in alignment with your values, then it's going to be lonely. It's going to be not a pleasant experience. So that is one of the reminders for me. But I think for your listeners, if you're out there, one, understand your values and never, ever betray them. Know that there is so many ways that you can create money. Make sure you do it with something that inspires you. That's something that lights you up. Something you have fun with. And ask yourself, what am I good at? What is it something that interests me? Like, like even though I'm coaching now, Peter, like, they're, like I'm creating my five-year vision, like, I don't just want to coach. I love to teach and I love transformation, but I want to do it in different ways. So like, for example, I'm going to start to shoot documentaries. And in my head, I'm like, people go, how do you start shooting a documentary? Well, it's like, you find out how documentaries are made and you take the steps the same way I started. So in my head, I'm like, well, I want to shoot documentaries. And I'm asking myself, well, why do I want to shoot documentaries? I love documentaries, but why do I want to shoot them? And I was like, well, that means I get to experience different things. I get to travel, which is another value of mine. And I also get to teach and show transformation that hasn't been shown in, in a certain way. And so for that to me, that hits a few of the boxes, right? And as long as you keep aligning with the things that hit your boxes, you will make the money. You will create it. Instead of trying to like oh, I'm looking at that person and they're, they're killing it. It's like, yo, they're killing it. Cool. But that might not be the path that you need to be taking. Yeah. I love that. Uh, one thing that I'm curious about is, you know, uh, to relax without feeling guilty. We started this podcast, you know, with, yeah, I used to chase the goals and all of that. And I know, Funny, funny. I started watching uh, for I don't know the the twentieth time. Eat, pray, love. Yesterday, <laughs> and and one of the things is when they're in Italy, they're like, "You Americans, the the only thing you know is how to work and never relax." And they're talking about dolce far niente, the art of doing nothing, right? And how how do you like for people that don't know how to relax without feeling guilty? What do you want to say to them? It's interesting because I'm, I'm pretty good with my balance. Um, and I say balance in the space of your, your hustle or your flow. Like, so I know it's crucial for me to go forward. I can't keep going at a certain pace. Like I can't like keep performing at a certain pace. I know I'm going to have to perform at a certain pace and then I can ramp it up and then calm it down again. And this is the thing also with meditation and mindfulness is that so many of my clients will be like, well, I don't have time for meditation. Oh, I don't want to sit. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, cool. Well, keep on getting the results you're getting. Because if you don't sit and be with yourself, this is when the biggest insights come. It's like you're riding a bike. And I, I use this analogy. You're riding a bike when you're on the meditation. And it allows you to rest, reflect, and connect. And when we do that, that gives us more energy to then output more things. Now, I get some of the best ideas when I rest, when I meditate, when I take a step away from my desk, when I step out of my normal zone, right? And when I do that on a consistent basis, this is when I create more versus me working 10 hours a day with no breaks and then going, why am I producing as much as if I was to work 45 minutes, break for five minutes, stand up, 
I literally got my assistant to order me um, a Swiss ball because I need to make sure I'm moving and shaking my energy. And I also ordered um, a mini trampoline. Oh, cool. <laughs> to, break, to break state and to move. And when I do, don't do that, like, otherwise, if I'm sitting all day, it's like your energy gets stagnant, you get stuck. So for those of, the, those of you that are listening or watching, it is crucial that we rest, that we take a step back and know that that is part of you creating more. Because you can end up creating that success or that goal, but you'll get there and you won't be able to feel it because your health is shot through the roof. You won't be able to experience it because your mind can't be still or can't be present with actually what's happening. And I see it so many times because this is what I coach people on. It's unbelievable. I, I watched the movie. I can't remember the name with uh, it's a guy and he he's going to lose his hearing in 30 days. And he used mm. to love hearing and you get to explore this guy. He's traveling cross country to record all his favorite sounds, because if he can't hear the sounds, he can at least watch others look at this, hear the sounds. Oh, wow. Uh, so very, very, very interesting. And, and, and after watching that, I've been much more cognizant of my hearing, like all the senses that we do have. And it's crazy that sometimes we're so caught up in our everyday life that we don't even realize that we ha have so many senses, you know, it's, it's just incredible. I, I'm just thinking about, we're putting all our, uh, you know, our phones and computers in charges, but our human body charge with no, we don't need no electricity. No, it's, it's unbelievable. And we, we do that for a hundred years or, yeah. or maybe even more or, or a little bit less. It, you just, you just hit it on the head. Like I've never heard somebody saying, I love hearing. Right. right. And, and it's, it's crazy. Cause like I'm 37. I've never heard somebody going, I like hearing yeah. never said, say that. And it's because you, you don't love it or you don't like, you wouldn't say that unless it's getting taken away or unless you're like really present. Yeah. Like you, you're not, you take things for granted. Like all of a sudden you, you have not I'll play basketball. And then all of a sudden I'll, I fractured my thumb. I had a hairline fracture. Oh, and all of a sudden you realize how important your thumb is. Yeah. I couldn't hold anything. I couldn't brush my teeth for like four months. Oh, wow. And you don't realize how important it is until it's taken away, you know? And so I think it's really important that we do look at different things and really become present. And how do you become more present? You, you go out into nature, you go and watch things, you sit still. Like I, I live in Bali and I have rice fields and it's, it's a, such a vast, like the land is, is crazy. Like it's, I mean, monsoon season now and it's like raining like crazy. And I'm almost like, oh my God, I hate monsoon. But I know that this is part of the, the seasons that have to pass through and it can't always be sunny. You know, um, I look at this massive plant outside of my window and Every, I reckon at least once a week, there's a new plant that comes out of that. And I'm like, wow, it's just birthing in front of me. It's just giving birth to another thing. And you know, if you start becoming simple again, and I'm not saying simple minded in a way where you're like, you're basic, but I'm like, simplify your life. You will start to see the things that matter instead of trying to get the quick fix and the dopamine hit from like social media, from drugs, from porn, from eating, you know, all those things. Emil, uh, I know we're running out of time. I, I have one more question for you and yep. I hope we can connect again because I, it feels like we have so much to talk about. Uh, so I'm all about uh, helping the audience that are listening to this and that are still here. Um, what's the first step they can do to get a little bit closer to their, to, to their dream or, or becoming a little bit more aligned with their emotions? Um, for your dream, I would say, write out your values. I would say, write out your top five values. What is it that, and if you don't know what your values are, what you can do is write out five people that inspire you, that you can relate to that. You're like, you know what? That person really lights me up. Every time I watch that person, I'm inspired by this person. And for that person, for pure example, 
Dave Chappelle is one of mine, right? So for Dave Chappelle, I'm like, well, he's in integrity. Why? Because he got offered $50 million and he didn't take it. How many men would do that? He's authentic. He doesn't care who's watching. He'll say what needs to be said. He's ambitious. He's a hustler. But he's also family orientated. And he values that more than the, what the world cares about. So like at least five values there, like family orientated, ambitious, um, in integrity. Um, he's a hustler and he's authentic. Now, if you write down five people that inspire you and then write down their five values or five traits of them, you're going to have 25 values. And then from there, what I want you to do is look at that list of 25 values. You're going to see a pattern in that list. And if you can just list and choose five values from that list and ask yourself, if I practice this value and I action it on a consistent basis, how would my life change? How would I show up differently? And then go out and figure out all the ways you can do that. For example, just say you want more courage. I want you to write down and research this, go on the internet and look it up and go, what is it like? What is all the steps I can do to be more courageous? And there's so many, there's so many websites out there that give you steps. Like you could be more bold. You could speak up. You could, you know, go and take more risks, calculated risks, not like stupid ones where you're going to jump off buildings, you know, like it's, it's really about actioning those values. And when you do that on a consistent basis, then you're going to be able to make decisions in that space that align with you. Thank you, Emil. Um, if people want to coach with you, connect with you, learn more about you, where's the best place to get in touch with you? Uh, they can go to my website, which is www.emilsteenveld.com or go to my Instagram at Emil Steenveld. Awesome. Thanks again, Emil. This meant the world for me. I, I've been trying to get a hold of you for a while. You're busy uh, changing the world in your way. We really appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me, brother. It's been awesome. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to this show and, and being here with us. We, we do this for you and it's completely free. The, the only thing I ask for you is that you learn something from this and take action. Uh, that will mean the world to me. Also, please share this with somebody that needs to hear this message. I, I'm about to build a big tribe with cool people that just want to live a happy life and create, you know, wealth and abundance and happiness in this world. And I'm super proud to be on this journey with you. If you have any questions, if you want to see more of these shows, just go to ilovesuccess.co. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, very, very easy. And uh, you can even reach out to me directly on Instagram and, and let me know what you're struggling with. Let me know what you, what you want to accomplish and how, how we can help. Uh, we are here for you. Thank you so much and see you guys next week.